to Red Wing. Um, and so I've got that recording now. Thanks again. <laughs> um, so we are here to talk with Britt Forsberg from the University of Minnesota to learn a little bit more about iNaturalist and how we can use that to monitor uh, pollinators and just kind of species in general and get folks out to some different green spaces throughout the state. Um, so with me today is Becca Tucker from Great River Greening as well. So Becca, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, so I'm Becca Tucker, uh, Metro Program Manager for Great River Greening. I'm pretty excited to see the uh, possibilities of where uh, we can kind of have all kinds of uh, interesting opportunities for uh, volunteers of all kinds to do monitoring both uh, on your own uh, in groups uh, and kind of being able to look at restorations that we have in progress uh, all throughout the state uh, and have some community engagement through uh, both iNaturalist and uh, some other platforms. And we're hopefully going to be doing some of this uh, work coming up in the summer and the fall uh, on properties uh, being managed through the Environmental Natural Resource Trust Fund, Clean Water uh, Land and Legacy Amendment, and the uh, webinar tonight is being um, funded through the National Fish and Wildlife uh, Foundation. So with that, I think I'll um, pass it back to Amy real quick, um, but we're pretty excited to learn more about iNaturalist and how uh, community engagement can happen through finding things and sharing that experience with others. Yeah, thank you. So we do have a number of projects we are actively looking for observations on. We'll touch on that a little later in the presentation as well. So we'll let Britt go over kind of the basics and how to use iNaturalist and some strategies for good photography tips to get a good identifiable uh, picture. And then we'll uh, circle back on kind of how we're using it once you've got the, the basics under your belt. So turn it over to you, Britt. All right, perfect. Uh, so I am an extension educator with University of Minnesota Extension. Uh, I work primarily with the Minnesota Master Naturalist Program. This is a pretty new position to me. I'm coming off of what I'm just gonna call the wildly successful uh, Minnesota Bee Atlas. We were also an Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund project. Um, we wrapped up last year, 2020, uh, but we had volunteers across the state helping us document what bee species lived where. Um, so looking at a couple different protocol areas, one of which was iNaturalist. So I would say that I am very well-versed in iNaturalist and I am a pretty good bee identifier, um, but I definitely have had to practice taking pictures so that other people can identify some of the bees that I see. Uh, so the outline for tonight, we'll go through what iNaturalist even is. Again, some tips and tricks that both you can get the most out of iNaturalist and that then you're kind of putting your best foot forward, uh, like Amy said, getting pictures that other people can identify. A couple of things that could be challenging and then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. All right, so the number one job that iNaturalist has is to be a database. Um, these are just the top entries I pulled from a volunteer project that I'm working on. Uh, with a capital region watershed district. So it's a way to store information. So you'll have a photo of the organ or some sort of documentation of the organism. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, what it is, where it was found, exactly when it was found. Um, so it's incredibly rich data source uh, that people from across the world are adding to. It's a tool that helps you with identification. So iNaturalist has one built-in identification feature. They call it the Identotron, which I think is just about the most fun name ever. Um, so they'll compare your photo to all of the research grade photos that they have, uh, and then give you a pretty good estimate. But they also rely on crowdsourcing. Uh, there's this community built in. So uh, I, I maybe should have included the original observation photo in here. Uh, but what I only knew as a spider, it was on my desk at work, uh, I put it up on a naturalist. Wild carrot knew a little bit more about spiders, could identify it as a wolf spider, get the family. Uh, but then this other user came in and got the genus. Uh, and then even left some helpful comments. 
So again, this community aspect that people are often very kind. There's no trolling in iNaturalist that I've ever seen. Uh, you know, sometimes people might be a little blunt when they leave their comments, like, well, there's this feature, but no one's ever being mean. No one's ever judging you for not knowing. Another community aspect is messaging back and forth. So I had an observation of a white mulberry um, from a St. Paul park near my house. And it turns out there are people who are really looking at both the white and red mulberries in Minnesota, trying to sort out where they are. Uh, one, the red mulberry is native, white is not. Uh, and so getting some more information and letting me know why they were using my photo and what else um, they needed to know from me. Uh, so all those together makes us this great tool for both the public and research researchers. So iNaturalist will tell you it's really easy. There are only three steps. Just find wildlife, take a picture, and share your observations. Okay, well, we're going to go into more depth. Uh, because if it's not something you're familiar with, turns out it's helpful to have a little more background. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is go to the iNaturalist website. Uh, so you can access either from a web browser or an app. Uh, we'll do the website first. They basically both do the same things, but sometimes one or the other is actually is easier to use. Um, we'll walk through this live and what it would be like if you're adding an observation. So if I could just verify that I am indeed, you can see this other tab it opened up into my now. Okay. Sometimes Zoom gets stuck on the old screen it was sharing. So thank you uh, for doing that. All right. So we went right in to my account and iNaturalist. Uh, this kind of ticker on the side is any updates. So if someone added, added identification to something that I observed, um, if there was a taxonomy change, those will all go there. But the thing that I really want to look at here is the upload button, right? Because the most important thing that you'll be doing is making your observations on these great river greening sites and then adding them to a naturalist. So there are a number of different ways that you can get your photos. If you put them on Facebook first, you can pull them from Facebook. You can do a batch upload. Uh, I'm just gonna go right from my computer. Oh, that didn't go to the picture I wanted first. Uh, so I'll start with this wild geranium. And here I'll show you where the identitron comes in where I can just click into that box for species name. I naturalist will analyze it and then give us uh, the best guess, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, they do tend to be pretty conservative where they um, will lean towards giving you just the genus and not suggest a species. And the, they'll come down later and the, well, it could be one of these. Uh, it's, the algorithm is getting smarter and smarter too about what's actually reasonable to see. So while the picture might kind of tick all the boxes to look like something that they have in the database, uh, it's getting, again, a lot smarter to recognize, is that even from where you are? Is it the time of year that it's been documented? And so they're, uh, and has it been seen nearby? So they're getting uh, much better with that. I happen to have planted this wild geranium in my boulevard, so I know exactly what it is. Uh, I took the photo on my phone, and so the metadata has already saved the date and time here, has saved the location. So uh, if I had any notes, I mean, I might add, this is a boulevard plant, or if I, you know, sometimes a measurement, you know, anything that seems useful for other people to know. The other thing that is not likely to come up in your Great River Greening activities, but I would do for this photo, is I would come over here and check this box for captive or cultivated. There's a big difference if you're a scientist in finding a plant that someone put there versus a plant that has made its own way there. Um, however, I'm not going to submit that. I don't think that my boulevard wild geranium is all that exciting. But, yes, and now it's concerned. I will now stop and move over to my phone to show you how the app works. Yeah, it's always the great part. Like here, look at my uh, my chin here, right? So I am on an Android device. Uh, the 
Apple's are the iPhone app is pretty similar. I think the big difference when I've looked at this with coworkers is that the, the button to add observations is in the lower center. Uh, mine is on the lower right. I feel pretty confident that you folks with iPhones will pick that up pretty quickly. All right, so here, a list of all my most recent observations, things that I've put up there. Uh, to add an observation, I'll click on that green plus sign at the bottom. And here I have the choice uh, that I could go without media. So I would have no picture, no video recording, nothing um, that would help another observer identify. And so it's really not a very helpful observation that way. It can't become research grade. It's just kind of me saying, you have to take my word for it. Uh, so you should add, add one of those other methods. <coughs> Excuse me. So you could take your phone out and you could be taking pictures while you're in iNaturalist. Uh, since I'm in my basement office, I have nothing to take good pictures of. So I'll choose an image and go into my photo stream. I did warn Becca and Amy that I have to make sure I have some plant or animal pictures here and you don't just see pictures of my toddler. But in a pandemic, when I don't really go places, I have a lot of pictures of my cute toddler. All right. So I will pick this one. Uh, and I don't know if iNaturalist is going to know what that is. OK, it did a remarkable job. So it is suggesting a couple of very believable possibilities. But something that I can do to make it even just a little easier, if I go back to my original screen, if you tap on the picture that you're uploading, and now this little pencil in the corner, uh, I should be able to edit. There we go. And now I can crop the picture. So iNaturalist, if you are an observer looking at someone else's pictures, doesn't have a really great zoom tool. And so uh, if you're able, make it a lot easier for those viewers to see what it is you're taking a picture of. So there we go. I've cropped it a little bit. I'm ready to go. Let's see if iNaturalist has any better suggestions. There, so now it feels uh, a little differently. Uh, I agree, a four-lined plant bug <coughs> on my Monarda. Uh, so again, uh, the picture was on my phone and so it shared the date, it uh, stored the times or the location. You know, for something like insects on plants, it's nice in the notes section if you wanna indicate exactly what it is that you're trying to look at. Because sometimes it's hard to tell, are you referring to the insect? Are you referring to the flower that it's on? And so just let the other reviewers know that. Uh, <clears throat> this is, you know, a wild bug. So I'm gonna go ahead, click that green check mark and add that to my naturalist. Okay, now I just need to be able, there we go. Stop my share. We'll come back. And go back to our presentation. <laughs> I mentioned <clears throat> the toddler. Um, everyone stayed very safe from COVID, uh, but I have all sorts of toddler daycare germs, so I apologize about that. All right, let's see what we have next. So those are the basics, how you add photos, but we'll take it to the next level. What are some of the advanced features that you might want to use? Uh, one giving some kind of object for scale. Uh, it's very hard to tell when you're looking at a 2D picture, just how big it might be. Uh, this was just some fungus that I found on my walk back from the bus stop. So I went and threw my keys down there. Now the observer has some kind of clue how big that is. <clears throat> Again, you could put something like that in the notes section, um, but this is a nice way for those other observers to know exactly uh, what that is. I have, there's one, well, the Minnesota Tracking Project always puts a ruler down next to their tracks. I've had one bee volunteer who would chill the bee and put it next to a ruler, and that just felt like you're making the rest of us with our blurry bee pictures look bad. Oh. So an everyday object works just fine for scale. Don't feel like you have to have a ruler. <clears throat> uh, like I showed you in the app, crop your photo um, so it's easier for the other viewers to see. I haven't found a way to do this on the website yet, um, so you, it's better to use another editing tool there. 
Um, but the app just came out with a feature to crop in app and it's delightful. All right, so focusing in Zoom. <clears throat> this is kind of a hard area because bees and other insects can move fast. Uh, sometimes you get these really beautiful pictures where the flower is perfectly in focus <clears throat> and your bee is just a fuzzy blob. So this picture on the left, just kind of everything about it is blurry. It does, however, actually show enough detail that you could identify that bumblebee. But again, if you're, make sure that you're trying, right, your hardest to get things in focus. Uh, the photo on the right is an example of different kinds of zoom. So if you have, I mean, if you're using a DSLR, of course you have, you know, like a telephoto lens and zoom capabilities, even a point and shoot camera, you know, you hear the zzzz, and you can watch the lens move in and out. There you're actually uh, zooming, right? You're being able to get closer and have the right lens. Uh, for some smartphones, it depends. Newer smartphones, the cameras are getting smarter. A lot of old ones, when you think you're zooming, you're really just cropping. So if you stand with your phone at a distance, you know, kind of move your fingers that you're zooming in. Uh, again, you're basically just cropping. And so the closer that you get zooming that way, um, the less resolution you have. You don't, you're just losing all of those megapixels. And so if that's the case with your phone, um, I would say my last phone was a Samsung Galaxy S7 and it definitely uh, did that. The better thing to do is take the picture with no zoom from as close as you can get and then crop that picture. Because again, you're gonna have a much better resolution and you'll come up with a, a less pixelated version. Uh, annotation is a very useful tool for the researchers who use iNaturalist. Um, all plants and animals now have this, <coughs> excuse me. And so there are a couple of different things that you can choose in there. Uh, and the advantage of choosing in annotations is that then when someone downloads the data, it shows up in a column. Uh, if you write that it was a caterpillar in the note section, that's great, but there's, it's not standardized. Right, and so it's gonna take a lot more work for that researcher to pour through and pull that kind of data out. Uh, but when it comes up in his own column from annotations, it's much, much easier. <clears throat> you know, and it's, it's gonna depend on what you find, how helpful that really is, or how, how able you are to add that information. Um, for bees, the sex is pre, uh, can be noticeable, uh, particularly bumblebees. You do need to know the sex in order to identify the species. Uh, bee larva, you're unlikely to see, and you're very unlikely to have any idea of what the heck kind of bee that is. Uh, but a lot of caterpillars are distinctive. Um, so again, that becomes more or less useful depending on what kind of organism you're looking at. Uh, so I, I mentioned that the zoom or the cropping feature I've only seen in the app, not on the web version. But these observation fields, I can only find the way to add them on the web and not on the app, <clears throat> unless you're adding to a specific project that's at requiring these fields. Um, but you can, you can choose any of the available fields if you're going through the web browser and add. Uh, so a lot of them are not going to be useful. I mean, time surveying might be, you know, it's gonna depend on how Becca decides that she wants to run these surveys. Um, but Particularly, um, these insect plant interactions, I think, are going to be the most important there. So you could add the forage plant. You could add the name of the flower that the bee is on or the butterfly is on. And again, the advantage of doing it here versus just adding in the notes is that that shows up as an easy column of data that the people who are pulling that up can use. So some, uh, some things to know, iNaturalist keeps pretty good tabs on rare species. Uh, you know, and I, I feel pretty comfortable with that for things like bees. This is a rusty patch bumblebee that I submitted. So uh, I, I feel okay telling you that last summer, I saw this rusty patch bumblebee in the Hamlin Midway neighborhood of St. Paul where I live. Right there, there's a very low chance that you're gonna look at my observation and go back and find any bees related to this bee. 
Uh, I know the, the reptile people are a little cagier. Um, they have some more fears about how iNaturalist data could be used. So iNaturalist, uh, for anything that's rare or threatened, will automatically obscure the location data unless you have special permissions in iNaturalist. Again, you're not likely to go back and find this bee. And frankly, uh, I was at the Capital Region Watershed District. And so I told them, and they were so excited to tell people that they had a rusty patch bumblebee in their rain garden, because uh, it is exciting to find this endangered bee. But a thing like a rare orchid, a plant that can't move, uh, you probably don't want to share those coordinates. It's just anybody, right? They could come, they could dig it up, these sorts of things. So uh, looking at that map on the right, that box, I think covers probably where I took the picture from, but that red dot at the bottom is nowhere near where I took it. So again, iNaturalist obscures that so that people can't track down those rare or threatened species. They also at the top next to the name, and um, there's that little red box with CR saying it's critical. Um, for any of those species, you can click on that and then iNaturalist will give you more information. Kind of on the other end of rare species that we're concerned about are introduced species. So this is another thing that iNaturalist keeps track of. Um, so this Megachile sculpturalis, we have very few observations of in Minnesota. Um, I think just one in iNaturalist, I think this is the only one. But again, iNaturalist knows it has that little exclamation mark at the top to let you know, whoa, 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 wait, something is up. You know, and for, for 1B maybe, but you know, it's you might not be able to go down, track down their nest, do anything about it. But for plants, it becomes very helpful. You can go back and find where that infestation is and then it can be managed um, if it hasn't been reported in other ways. Because there are peer, periodic data dumps from iNaturalist into EdMaps. EdMaps is the software that most invasive species managers use. Um, but iNaturalist is way more user-friendly for the average person who's just out taking pictures, wondering what things are. All right. So one more uh, tool that you could use in iNaturalist is this identify tool. And so I added a screenshot at the very top. This is the top bar of the web browser. Again, just, just the word identify is one of those tabs. So here's an example. So there are five photos here. Having more than one photo is really nice for identifiers. Uh, and I, I know Don here, D. Leon one. So he only felt confident saying it was a bumblebee. That's great, that's a step, right? It's something, uh, it's much better than leaving no identification. Because most people who are adding identification in iNaturalist tend to be, they have some taxon that they're really interested in. No one's like, I know everything about everything. Just show me all the pictures, right? They're more like, well, I'm really interested in plants or even in plants, like I, I would study grasses. You know, the, could be I study jumping spiders, whatever it is. So give some identification because otherwise, if, if Don had left this up just as living thing, I wouldn't have seen it when I go and look through um, photos to identify. Um, so give it your best guess. It could be as broad as insect, that's totally fine. But again, something that gives people something to go off of. So I have suggested a brown belted bumblebee. Um, again, pretty good at my bumblebee identification. And then I would just click save. So then Don would get a notification that I added that. He could go back and look at it. You know, does that seem reasonable? Does it not? He could agree, but if he feels strongly that it's not, he doesn't have to. Um, I naturalist will wait until two out of three people agree on the species level, uh, and that will make it research grade. But again, you don't have to agree with something just because someone else suggested it. All right, right. We did have one question oh, pop up in the chat uh, before we get too far ahead. Uh, Carrie asks, uh, so if I wanted to share a picture of the showy lady slipper that I'm aware of on private property, I don't need to worry about removing the location. Is that correct? Uh, you don't have to. I mean, again, it'll it'll obscure to. But I I can't remember what radius it uses. You know, it does have, a, you know, a, a formula that it uses. If you're still feeling kind of uncertain, which is totally okay, uh, you can change the setting of just that photo uh, to where the coordinates are private. And in that case, if someone were studying it and they really wanted to know, 
and they maybe you knew them from a university, you had some, you looked them up and they seem trustworthy, uh, you can clear that photo for just them. You don't have to have all of your coordinates uh, be, be open. I know sometimes people feel a little funny when they put a picture in a naturalist and like their home address pops up. You know, so if you want to bring that down to private, that's fine. The GPS on phone is pretty accurate, but it gives you a lot more decimals in your longitude and latitude than it actually is accurate to. So there are plenty of times that I put an observation up and then the dot on the iNaturalist shows up across the street. Right? I mean, it's just, it's not like military satellite down to the foot. Um, but yeah, that is a good question and a good clarification that it will obscure it, but get just your comfort level for that sort of thing. And there are some other protections you can have there. And thank for bringing that up. As much as I worked really hard at getting my two screens arranged, now my chat is behind my presentation, so I can't see it anyway, Amy. So I appreciate <laughs> bringing it up as it came. Uh, so the pictures that I've showed you and I naturalist so far have just been of the living things themselves. But you can add all sorts of other things to iNaturalist. Uh, so starting up in the upper left, there's this wasp nest. Uh, it's, it was way above the street, so I didn't get a very close, good photo. But uh, old wasp nests, you know, if they're from the previous year, there aren't any living wasps there anyway, and so you could go get a pretty good picture. Moving over, the next one, there's some scat. I felt pretty certain that it was coyote. Um, all the fur kind of long and ropey. Uh, this bird, it, it seems a little morbid, but the things don't have to be alive. And I've actually found several uh, birds that I assume are window strikes. You know, they're on the sidewalk next to some kind of store with a big glass front. And every time that I put that up, um, a curator for a, a project that's just about bird strikes will go in and I'll get a notification that they've taken my photo. Um, so there are, you know, different people study that in different ways. You know, Audubon, Minnesota was working on it in the downtown areas and they actually had volunteers who walk the perimeter of certain buildings downtown to pick up the birds and identify them. But it is, I mean, you can learn a lot. So the, the bird species that they find aren't directly correlated to all the birds in the area. There are some that disproportionately seem to hit windows and some that, you know, there are a lot of these birds, but we find almost no strikes. And so what makes them better able to navigate? And so again, it, it seems like, well, here's this sad dead bird, but it's this actually rich data source that people can use. Uh, continuing clockwise, there's a track there. Again, I threw my key down there and to help with some scale, particularly, you know, this I assumed was a deer, but you know, deer and moose tracks look pretty similar. If you don't have any ski or any idea what size they are, um, yeah, your location can help you clue that up. But again, just giving your, your observers some more clues. Next up, uh, this milkweed pod. So it, it's still recognizable. There are a number of prairie plants, um, Lespedeza, Monarda, things that you can tell from their dried up seed pods. Uh, and it's again, still very helpful data. So go ahead and add that. Uh, the last left-hand corner is on here, uh, sort of in general for a naturalist. As far as I know, no one has ever submitted an audio recording of a bee buzzing and being able to identify it. But you can add video, uh, both video and audio recordings to iNaturalist. So great for birds, frogs, those sorts of things. All right, so uh, kind of the last thing before we practice just a little bit, some tips specifically for insects. Uh, so one is to have multiple photos. There are, uh, these insects are pretty small, right? And there are uh, different characteristics and it's very hard often to see everything that you need to see to identify them in one picture. For this rusty patch bumblebee on the right, you know, the face, the shape of the face is important. Seeing the rusty patch on the back is important. Uh, the side can be helpful depending on the bumblebee species uh, what the coloration is, as well as looking at the hind leg, because that's a really simple way to determine if it's male or female. So again, if you could get multiple pictures from different angles, 
And sometimes it's not even going to be, it's not going to feel quite as clear as I, I have the face, I have the side, I have the back. Um, but, you know, your observers might just be able to see the one thing that they, they need to feel confident about their ID if you get it from a slightly different view. Uh, and again, with a caveat that these bees are going about their business. They're not always posing on purpose for you. And so you're not always going to get the things that you want. Uh, insects are cold blooded. You can cool them down. You could put them in a small Tupperware cup, Ziploc bag. And we have these made for the bee atlas. That little depression at the bottom um, keeps the bee from getting schmucked as you lower that uh, tube down. But cool them off in, a, in the fridge, maybe a cooler with some ice, they slow down and then can be a little more cooperative to get the pictures you want. Don't put them in the freezer. I did have a colleague who tried to do the same, like, well, if I wanna cool my pop down really quickly, I put it in the freezer. Maybe instead of waiting so long in the fridge, no, 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 you kill the insects, don't do it. Uh, so the, the tip that does not work for people who are impatient is take the time to practice, to observe this behavior. So this two-spotted bumblebee here, um, I've noticed that bees, when they're on Monarda like this, uh, they don't stay in one place very long, right? There's not a lot of nectar in just one tube, uh, but then they tend to kind of work their way around horizontally. So thinking about where that bee is going to go next helps you uh, predict and then get a better photo. Or if you're out in a big patch of flowers and noticing like, you know what? They're really digging on echinacea today, right? Then you know where to train your eye that you're ready when they get to the place um, that you want them to be. Again, it's going to be a feeling and it's going to be time, but it's really going to help you get better insect pictures. Last, to know your equipment. Uh, I could give you a lot of tips and things that work really well for my phone or my camera, but if it's not the same phone or camera that you have, it's not necessarily going to work. Uh, so you know, can have add-ons, you know, if it's a different lens or even smartphones, you can buy those little clip-on uh, macro lenses. Yeah, and just, just try it and you have to see what works best for you. Those Rusty Patch Bumblebee pictures, they're like, I'm very proud of finding a Rusty Patch Bumblebee. And I, I, you know, I, I managed to get the things that I needed, but I was on a walk where I decided that I was going to sort of unplug from technology, leave my phone at home on purpose. And then I had to use my husband's phone and I just wasn't what I was used to. So the pictures weren't as good as what I knew I would have done with the device that I'm used to. Um, so that's again, that sort of time element of just practicing uh, and knowing again, just what's right for you. And if someone else gives you tips and they don't help you, you don't have to try them. All right, couple of limitations to a naturalist. On the left, the, the bumblebee on, is on a cone flower, but that's not a real color of cone flower that we have in nature. It's a cultivar, it's a garden plant. Uh, and a naturalist does not recognize those kinds of horticultural varieties very well. Uh, so if at all possible, uh, stick with native species. Even if it's a native species, if you know that it's part of landscaping or the garden where you planted it, again, look for that captive or cultivated uh, checkbox. And then there are going to be some insects, uh, I'll speak specifically to bees, but it really doesn't matter how good your pictures are. They just can't be identified to species. Uh, so don't feel too disheartened. The center there is a resin bee, uh, Herides, and we have no Herides identified as species in Minnesota on a naturalist. Right? There are hundreds of Herides there, and they're just, if you have a pinned specimen in the lab and you have a microscope and you can pull genitalia out and you can look for dents in the clip, like, yes, they're identifiable. Uh, but just things that don't come across in photos. Or the graphic on the right, uh, two bumblebees, Bombus oricomus and Bombus pennsylvanicus, that uh, telling them apart is how close are those simple eyes, those three black dots, to this imaginary line that you draw across a compound eyes. Again, that's something that's super duper hard to see in a picture. Uh, so there are gonna be times that you do your best and it's, it's not gonna be enough, but that's not your fault. It's just that these are really tiny things. And sometimes the characteristics that distinguish two species are really small differences. 
uh, iNaturalist does skew towards bigger insects. Uh, so these are the top 10 bees that have been documented on iNaturalist in Minnesota. And the rossy patch bumblebee I called out because it's apparently the eighth most common bee in Minnesota. Well, <laughs> it is a federally endangered species. So I can guarantee that there are many other bees that are far more numerous in Minnesota than rossy patch bumblebees. Uh, but uh, bumblebees are easier to take pictures of. They're bigger. We hear them. So you might even turn around to notice it. Uh, they have identifiable characteristics in photos. There's a lot of things that make that easier for someone to, to first take the picture, but then to identify it. So you have to take some of those statistics with a grain of salt. I mean, there are a whole bunch of tiny sweat bees that basically nobody in the bee world can identify to species anyway. So the dialectus group, I, you know, you find a couple of good people and then everyone ships their specimens there. So even when you have specimens, there are some that are just really hard to identify. All right, so uh, I'm gonna ask you guys, I have a couple of iNaturalist examples I pulled from your iNaturalist names that Amy gave me from registration. Uh, so we're gonna start, these are lovely photos. And I have to say, I've seen CG Planiuk on iNaturalist for years, and I've never known who that person is. So A, if you could tell me if you're on this call, uh, but B, the rest of you, go ahead and use the chat. What makes these really good pictures? And I'll see if I can pull my, while you're doing that, if I can pull my window. There we go. All right, yeah, you guys are picking up on some, some good characteristics. They're all well-focused. There are, from multiple angles, and so you can see different parts of that bee. Very nice. Yep, clean the head, the face. All right, these are my pictures. So don't feel bad at all about pointing out what about these pictures needs help? You will not hurt my feelings at all. You're not picking on someone else who's in this meeting. Yeah, so point where zooming in could be helpful because that B is like one one hundredth of that whole frame. Yeah, there's, there's no detail there. It's a small black bee. Is someone suggesting a side profile, right? Both of those are very close to the same image. Oh, <laughs> and yes, thank you, Pren. It, the, the cone flower did come out quite well in that picture. Okay, how about these? What are good or bad things about these pictures? These ones are also mine. So again, no hurt feelings if you're feeling critical or notice something that could be improved. There's certainly a learning curve to this. I mean, I'll take your lack of comments to mean that you kind of all feel meh about this. And that's, that's exactly right. They're all kind of middle of the road pictures here. Right, the, the lighting isn't great because uh, the camera couldn't figure out if they wanted the exposure for the light background and flower or the dark, dark colored butterfly. Um, I was shooting in auto mode there. Sometimes in SLR, you can fix some of that. And, and sometimes you can edit your pictures later, you know, yeah, and change some contrast to make it easier. Uh, I typically don't, but yeah, you can identify it. It is a red admiral butterfly but there's kind of nothing spectacular about that. And again, that's okay. Not all of your pictures on a naturalist need to be works of art. It's more satisfying when they are, but you know, not that important. All right, here's an one I pulled from my naturalist uh, and just want to point out a couple things. I think for time, I'll kind of talk you through it. Right away, it does feel a little bit like you're far away from that bee but it is a research grade photo, right? The, you can still see the things that you need to see to identify it. Uh, and then what Judy did that was really helpful is adding comments here. 
So again, knowing that she knew to look for the, the yellow segments and then uh, what it's forging on. All right. What about these guys? Anybody want to throw out an identification here? So I pulled these and I like them because uh, the what the caterpillars are eating is identifiable. And sure, we know that they're monarchs and monarchs eat milkweed. Uh, but again, uh, that's just another data point, helpful information that we can see. Yeah. All right, and last one, uh, the thing that I wanna point out here about Amy's picture is that she was ready to take a picture of this caterpillar, right? So that's, that's half the battle is being in the right place at the right time with your phone or camera. Um, and, and just taking advantage of those moments that the caterpillar was crawling across, I don't know if it's a backpack, glove, whatever, um, but being, being ready and thinking about it um, is half the battle. And that last example here, another resin bee, again, just showing that Don got these beautiful pictures. He has different angles. They're great. They're wonderfully focused, um, but that just is a species. You know, these are uh, maybe a quarter inch long, but that's on a flea bane, right? So if it's half the size of a flea bane, we're now getting pretty small. Uh, and they're they're ones you just need specimens in a lab and a microscope. All right, I will turn it back over to you guys. Great, thank you, Britt. So this is an example of one of Great River Graining's kind of projects and how we're currently using iNaturalist. Uh, so on this map here, you can see kind of an outline and shaded yellow area. So this is a portion of Lebanon Hills Regional Park. So this is an area we're doing kind of active restoration on, and it's the area we want to focus in on. So Lebanon Hills is a huge park, and our particular area of interest is highlighted in yellow here. So you'll be able to see that if you navigate to the kind of the projects on Great River Greening's profile page. Uh, so to do that, you can kind of see there. So I took a screen grab of it's the Great River Greenings just profile page on iNaturalist. And over on the far right, there's the projects tab circled in red. If you click on projects, you'll see a full list of all of our current projects we are looking at. Um, we've got a number of sites in the metro and down into southern Minnesota as well, where we have active projects and we're looking for those added observations. So. Um, Great River Greening is a small team. We only have about 15 employees, and of those, I think, what, Becca, correct me if I'm wrong, like six or seven are kind of ecologists and have the active projects, and, you know, we don't get to get out in the field nearly as much as we would like to be making these observations for ourselves, so any added help um, is much needed and appreciated and gives us a better understanding of what folks are seeing where and throughout different times of the year. And the great part about iNaturalist is that uh, in order to participate in this type of project, all you have to do is be within the area and make an observation in the area itself. The program, the website um, automatically collects all of those um, public observations from within that orange border and um, drops it into our project itself. So when I was at Lebanon Hills, uh, the other week and I saw those monarch caterpillars. I took a picture, took a couple pictures, uh, uploaded them right then and there. Didn't have to do anything else, didn't have to tag Great River Greening, didn't have to add them to a project, but you can see them, I don't, I'm pointing at my screen, uh, you can see them there on that bottom right of the snapshot. Uh, so they are actually one of those red dots uh, within the project itself. So in this case, it's, it's uh, being in the right place uh, contributes to these projects. And we have um, all of those red dots just from the last couple months of having this project active. So that's uh, literally anybody taking pictures within that area, uh, giving us a lot of really good information about what kind of plants and animals and insects um, we're seeing as we are doing this active habitat restoration uh, with Dakota County. So it's a really powerful tool and from the, um, 
user's end from you and me, literally just have to upload a picture and it's, it's uh, in that project itself. Very cool. I, um, let me just add that if you're going to find projects in the app, um, there's uh, Macaulay who calls it the hamburger, the, the three lines for a menu. Um, you can click on that and it'll expand uh, on your phone or your tablet. Uh, and then you can look for projects there. So that does go across both. Otherwise, I think that we, oh, I'm sorry, you have one more. Oh, yes, and that um, this is a kind of a new endeavor for us, and we are, we were exploring it kind of in the middle of the pandemic as well as trying to find a different way to allow folks to help us out, volunteer their time, and get out and explore these places kind of independently as well. So as much, we appreciate all your observations and your help, um, you know, identifying as well. So if you spend some time on the back end from home, looking at other observations and identifying things, confirming observations that you're comfortable with um, in our projects as well. We would love for you to report that time and we count it as volunteer time. And that's also very important for us to kind of track as well. So there's a kind of a tiny URL there in this presentation. We'll be sending this out afterwards as well. So if you do go out to our project sites, we can track that time and just let me know if you have any questions really. Um, so the observations we would like kind of reported in our timekeeping system would be more the ones on our active projects, but we definitely want you to explore our naturalist, use it in your own kind of neighborhood and backyard as well and join the community. So. And as Amy and Britt mentioned before, this is all kind of um, hopefully leading towards some more active participation on um, project sites in the future where we'll be uh, kind of collecting a group of people that are interested in doing this type of monitoring, uh, giving them a little bit more information about an individual site, and then um, kind of doing a little bit more coordinated kind of monitoring um, for seeing how a restoration what is it like at the very beginning before any work is done? Uh, what is it like? What kind of plants and animals are, are using that particular space throughout the restoration and after the restoration to kind of see that other side of uh, the habitat more than just, well, we planted some plants. That's, that's fantastic. But also here are the insects that are using these new plants that weren't there at the beginning. Uh, so we'll be um, reaching out more as the time goes on to kind of engage more people uh, in, in those areas, we're definitely, we'll hopefully have some projects in Scott and Carver counties as well. Um, and until then, we just uh, encourage people to try this out. Literally, you can do this anywhere in your backyard or any walks you're on. Um, and then if you, like Amy said, want to uh, participate a little more on the greening specific side, she'll send those links out of the current projects that we're working on. Yeah, and the tip once you're in the iNaturalist, it's easier if you're looking at the desktop version on the, the web browser to kind of really dig into the project specific sites. So um, I saw a question about the Lilydale project. Um, if you go into the project on the website and kind of scroll down, you'll be able to see that map with the shaded and yellow kind of polygon. And that's where we'd like you to focus the observations. Again, Lily Dale is a large park um, and we're really looking at the area near the, the Brickyard kind of hiking trailhead there, right near Cherokee, Cherokee Park, so. Yeah, it's, well, you could probably find that link now and throw it in the chat, huh? But yeah, other questions, it looks like most of these coming in the chat are specific to the project. Um, that's great. Uh, Becca and Amy can take those. I'm happy to take other more specific uh, naturalist or insect questions too. Uh, the only slide I skipped was everything that Amy and Becca just said about, yep, just go out there, take some pictures, try it out. <laughs> uh, so how close was I to this bee? Uh, this is a male bumblebee. So, uh, you know, you're pretty close, you're pretty, safe getting close to any bee, uh, but in particular males don't have stingers. Uh, I took this one on my phone, just walking back from a bus stop. Um, I mean, I was probably about a foot away. 
but I like it because you can see his little mustache. Yeah, and so looking at uh, how close you can get and not bother them will depend a little bit on a number of different factors. Uh, this was in the fall when sort of like October-ish where all you see are male bumblebees. Uh, they don't have a, they don't get to go back to the nest. So they can get pretty cold and be pretty slow uh, sort of beginning and ends of the day. But a lot of times when the females are out foraging, they're very intent. Um, they are just, they, the busy as a bee uh, description is not inaccurate. <laughs> so they're just so focused on collecting pollen that they're really not, for the most part, concerned with you. Sometimes your shadow will spook them a little more uh, than just you physically being there. And it depends too, I would say, on what flower they're on, because some of them, like roses, they'll spend a lot of time moving over the pollen and buzzing around and picking things up. Um, but flowers that don't have as much pollen or nectar, they move from flower to flower to flower a lot more quickly. And so again, that will maybe feel like you're scaring them away, but it really has nothing to do with you. Uh, they, they just don't care about people a whole lot. They have no reason. All right, so a question about the cropping feature. So when you're making an iNaturalist, well, here I can stop sharing, go back. Happy to refine that. So I'll start an observation, choose an image. <clears throat> and so it's before I click that green check sign that I want to submit it. Um, I can go back. So I have the, there's that camera and plus button where I could add another picture or I can look at the picture I've already chosen. So if I choose the one I already have up there, then the pencil at the lower left, I just don't have a mouse for you to follow. Uh, pencil is, there we go. Gets me the cropping tool. Uh, flowers don't move, so it's easier to get in close. So I could still do a little if I wanted. The checkbox at the top right will accept it. Um, so now it has that extra zoomed cropped picture or version. And then this arrow in the top left would bring me back so that I could submit it. Uh, this is another so one that I just took at my house. I planted it. Um, so I would make sure to check captive or cultivated. Sometimes that's a really good way. Um, if you've got a picture that you have a, a preview for in that little uh, individual screen uh, and then you maybe go back to a different screen and it's not centered and you kind of lose the um, lose the centering of that photo itself. Um, a lot of those thumbnails are, are squares. So as I crop, I always kind of think, can I crop this to a square and put the thing I'm looking at in the very center? Um, not only does that help me find the picture again, it also helps the uh, other ideas and the um, identitron, which I did not know that that was the name of. I think it's fantastic. Uh, we know that this is a ton of information to be going through. So we will also be sending out some other links with other tutorials and um, just kind of website resources that you can go back and uh, learn at your own pace, figure out something that you're uh, specifically have a question or don't even know that you have a question on yet. Uh, so that hopefully will help. But yeah, we recognize an hour is not a, not a lot of time to give you this much information, especially when you're not actively trying the um, app or website out yourself. Yeah, the easiest way is if I could go out one-on-one -on -one with each of you and just practice. But uh, thanks to COVID and also my own time management, here we are in a webinar. But I agree, Carrie. Windy days get me all the time.
All right. Does anyone have any final questions? Well, we have Britt here to help. Otherwise, like Becca and Britt mentioned, we will be sending out this presentation, additional tutorial links, and different Great River Greening project sites that are currently active, as well as kind of keep you all looped in as new projects come online or as we start to develop more kind of monitoring projects. You'll be our our first our first call. So. All right. Well, thank you again for joining us. And thank you, Britt, for all the helpful tutorials. I know I learned a lot as well. I hope you all did too. No. Becca, do you have any final parting words you'd like to share? Uh, as a person who's now at a desk more uh, often than I'd like, the other option is to uh, look at pictures that other people have posted too. So that's, you know, the other side of this whole uh, interface too, is that you can, um, ID other people's observations or even just see that they're there and kind of have that kind of uh, wildlife engagement when you're not outside either. So get out, get out and explore, but also explore while you're inside too. Uh, the kind of both sides of it, I think to me, teaches me a ton of stuff. So I'm pretty excited to have other people get experience and, and play around with it and see where we go from there, both as uh, individuals and, and working on all these different neat restoration opportunities. All right, with that, thank you everybody. Uh, we'll be in touch soon. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you.